Um, once again, kind of thinking of that idea of ways to, you know, do things using music, things like that. Uh, I, I picked this this song, and I don't know how many of you know know the piano guys. You've heard, heard the piano guys. They're they're amazing. They're very talented guys. Uh, I always joke with people, and this might go over some people's heads in the sense of pop culture references and all that, but I have two favorite One Direction songs. If you know One Direction, they're a boy band, like today. I have two favorite One Direction songs, and they're both done by the piano guys. They redid them, and they're musical. And on the one, it's actually, they've opened up the piano, and they're plucking the, the things inside, and they've got a violin, but it's amazing. They're running around pounding on the piano, and it's so musical and beautiful. This song is... It's uh, Amazing Grace with Bagpipes, which in and of itself is amazing. And the song, Fight Song. Now, if you, if you, kind of a pop culture, once again, a pop culture reference, Fight Song became this popular song a couple of years ago because there was this uh, young lady who had cancer, and she was on, like, the Ellen show, and she was on America's Got Talent, and she sang it, and it was all over the place, you know, people talking about how amazing, and it was her theme song, and it helped her get fight through cancer, and she met the singer, and you know, all these different things, and crazy things. When you listen to the lyrics of the song, it is so worldly. Not in the sense of, like, you know, like sexual and dirty, but in the sense of, it's about me and my fight, and I don't care what anybody else says, I'm going to do, the, you know, and it's, I'm going to fight on. And I, I just found it so ironic, so interesting that the piano guys decided to do fight song with amazing grace and put them together and you just go man that's that's a that's a, a, a really hard thing to listen to in one sense but it's beautiful when you hear them playing it in the musical sense the other reason i picked this song is i want to share just a story um and i'm kind of going out on a limb being a guest speaker in a church sharing stories about resources and stuff like that, and critiquing some things. But uh, I, I want you to know, you'll be, you'll, you're going to be in a small group setting, and somebody is going to say something that is heretical. And how do you handle that as a group leader? How do you handle that as a group leader? And I, I, I like I said, I, I picked this song because it, it deals with a, a different situation. But I had someone reference a book. We were talking about a topic, and someone said, a book that's really been helpful to me is, uh, um, and I'm just going to go here and, and say, they said, Heaven is for Real. Um, it was just a really, a really good book, and it was really helpful for me. And I, I, I cringed. <laughs> Because this was, this was one of those ladies, and if you're not familiar with the book, I'm not going to give you a full critique of it or anything like that. It's just, it's not a, it's not a, a, a good book, um, even though it's a Christian bestseller for some reason. Um, sorry. Uh, this lady, kind, older lady, what do you do? She's thrown it out to the group. This book has been a help to me. What do you do? I know what I did. I'm just, I want to, I threw that out there to say, what would you, what would you do? Let us pray. Let us pray. <laughs> Let us pray. What would you do? I mean, think about it. What would you do in that situation? Someone throws out this heretical bomb in the middle of your group. What do you do? How do you handle it? What are biblical principles? Biblical principles? Right. Yep. I handled it, and I'll just, I'll just share this um, with you. And, and I kind of knew it and was familiar with it. I, I, right after she said it, after cringing a little bit, I, I suggested some other things that would be good resources. I talked to her right after and just said, hey, listen, I just want you to know this, 
book is there's some things in there and she was very understanding and sometimes they'll be very understanding and sometimes they won't and I said and just so you know next week I'm going to talk about this a little bit we're just going to take a little aside and, and, and review it and talk about it and, and in that sense you're one addressing it in that moment so that everybody doesn't go out and run and buy that book oh so and so recommended I'm going to go so you address it there you talk to her about it and then you talk to the group the next week about correcting it there's probably different ways, better ways, different ways that people could handle it. But you want to be able to care for the person that isn't mature in their thinking, at least in that situation. You want to be able to care for them, but you also have to remember you're responsible for the whole group too. So you don't want to just go, that's a heretical book. Why are you reading that book? You're stupid. Like, no, no, you don't want to, you don't want to be harsh like that. But at the same time, you want the group to know this is where we're going. This is what, what the Bible says. So, so thinking of that idea of being in a, in a group setting and ministering to the individual there, but also the group. So, Would you recommend asking a question as to what was it about the book that you, you thought was really helpful? So I, you could evaluate that particular part of it? Yeah, that would probably be, and I didn't do that in this situation, but that, that's, a good, that's a good thing to think about doing that in the sense of talking to her individually. I, I would not in the sense of in the group setting after this this moment happens opening it up for discussion right there because you don't know where it's going to go and things, but just kind of thinking about that idea. Um, so uh, just being aware of that and, and uh, how, how do you handle those kind of situ situations. Okay. So uh, the second part we're going to do, we're going to talk about small groups and for the rest of the evening, the small groups and the practical steps. So let's go ahead and go there to part two. And I've already addressed some of this, but uh, uh, so this is going to kind of get into the first part is some big picture small group things. And then the second part or the third part is the, the real kind of some real practical things. Um, what is a small group ministry? Good. Let's see here. Once again, it's that idea of it's an attempt. Okay? It's an attempt uh, to build relationships, which should be happening, and in, in, in your notes, I don't have that second part there, but should be happening, I, I, I originally wrote down in the notes, naturally, but that's not correct. It, it's not that they should be happening naturally. They should be happening supernaturally. Naturally is what happens at like a VFW or an American Legion or a bridge club. Or, you know, you have people that are, are, you're alike and you have a similar nature. And your church should be supernaturally. It, it, people should look and go, I don't know why you people get together. You're so different, you know, in, in, a, in a sense. You come from different backgrounds, different things like that. So there's a sense of supernaturally uh, by creating opportunities to have God-glorifying conversations and discussions rooted in the Bible. Okay? So, uh, thinking about that idea of an attempt. As Pastor Mark said, his first time leading a church with small groups and... Um, you have to understand, in, in any church, even churches that have been doing small groups, there is a sense of, and, and they might not acknowledge this, but there is the sense that it's an attempt to build relationships. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes there's groups that are amazingly awesome and fruitful and things, and sometimes there are groups that don't work. Um, you, you just really want to be encouraging people to build relationships with one another. Um, and I just keep coming back to that, but that's that idea of, Thing, things that should be happening anyway, you're trying to create, you're, trying, you're attempting to build relationships. Okay? So, thinking of, of this idea here, um, what is the purpose of a small group? Is it the transformation of people or the glorification of God? Is it the transformation of people or the glorification of God? There's three possible answers. The first one, the second one, or the both of them. Uh, you don't even need to write this next thing down because I have the notes really uh, set up for you. If you just, in your notes, just cross out the is it. Okay, so cross that out. And then right in front of that or, you just put an F. 
the transformation of people for the glorification of God. And, and that's really what, what you want to happen. And obviously, as we've talked about, you are not going to be transforming people. It's going to be God working in you and through you and, uh, and, and growing you and helping you, you grow them. So, um, do have any, any questions about those first two there? Because this next part we're going to have a little bit of more discussion. Okay. okay. So, um, I don't think I wrote anything down there except for talking. About, I have some things in my notes here, but what are the marks of a, a fruitful small group? Thinking, first of all, of God glorified. So, with this, we're going we're to talk about some of these things a little bit and have some, some discussion. But um, what would you think that idea of a fruit of an effective small group um, is God glorifying, glorifying God? Um, what does that mean? What does it mean to glorify God? And as you give answers, I'll, I'll shorten them up a little bit just for the sake of writing them down. But what else? Because we, we use God glorifying a lot. We talk about it in churches. But, I mean, what does that really mean, you know, in a sense? So what does it mean that a group is glorifying God or God glorifying? I like the actual act of expression that's all in you. Okay. And can you expand on that a little bit? Worship. So someone else other than Pastor Nathan, right? How could you do this in a small group setting? And he can't answer it because I think he has some ideas of ways that he would, just even in the way he was emotional and expressing the answer. What would be some ways that you can worship and express in a small group setting without having like a full band up front and, you know, singing songs? Prayer. Prayer? How you talk? What do you mean? How you talk, and I'm just going to write underneath here. Attitude. Um. Think about this. Maybe, maybe it's at the beginning of your group for the first couple of weeks. You just say, hey, can everybody prepare a three-minute, two-minute testimony to share with the group? And, and I would tell you this. Even that, putting that time limit on, and, and I mean not just saying, hey, a two- to three-minute testimony and letting someone ramble for 20 minutes. I mean holding them to two to three minutes and explaining this to them. Think about how you would share your testimony with someone at work. How you would share your testimony with someone at a restaurant. How you would share your testimony with someone in a situation where you don't have 20 minutes. You have, uh, my boss wants me to be working, not sitting there talking to my coworkers all day. But I've got two minutes at lunch to talk to someone about. How would you tell them about what God has done in your life and how he saved you? So then it becomes not just a... We're short on time. We only, you can only share two, minute, two minutes. Because, but it's like real practical. How can you do this so that when you're facing these situations in the world, what can you do? So testimonies, what else? Answer to share answers to prayer. You might even want to have someone in your group be uh, taking note of prayer requests in a notebook and then making notes of when they're answered as you kind of have that as a testimony of, of what, what's going on in your group. What else? Specifically watching for things about the character of God. Okay. So, um, watching, uh, looking for the character of God. And I would tell you this, and this is a hard thing to do because sometimes 
People don't like when it's done to them, but it is a good thing to do. When you see God working in someone else's life, tell them and others about it. You know, I I saw you at church having a conversation with so-and-so, and and that just really occurred. You know, but having those those opportunities to share with what what God is doing, how God is working in people, and others can see it. Um, Anything else? Bibles and open them up to Psalm 34. And if I could have someone read Psalm 34 verses 1 through 3. Think about what happened with this verse, what's going on in these verses. David is writing and he's talking about, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continue to be on my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. And then that last verse, verse 3 says, what, what, does he, what does he do in verse 3? He invites people. What, what, what's going, our worship should be, there should be a private aspect of our worship. In the sense of it's, it's on our own. But it should not stay private. As we're worshiping God and, and understanding these truths of him. That should spill out in the sense of inviting other people to, to come and praise him. Um, and really, that's, it's only, once again, going back to the idea of not naturally, but supernatural. In the sense of it, it should happen. When you think about how awesome God is, it's not like I want to keep this to myself. I want to invite other people to do that. So thinking of this idea of, of God glorifying um, okay, anything else there uh, from that uh, with the idea of, of glorifying God as a, as a, a fruit? Okay. So we're going to go through a, a, each of these kind of, um, some of them more quickly than others, but uh, um, you can write some of the ideas down, think about how you can incorporate them in your group setting. But um, life transforming. So thinking about a group being life transforming, and understanding that transformation doesn't come from you as a leader, it comes from God and Jesus working in them. But uh, uh, think about, the, well actually to go back to the, the God glorifying, I forgot to give you the thing that I had written down here. It's God is first. It's God's word, not opinion. When you're talking, it's, it's God's word and, and not your opinion that you're sharing. Um, it's prayer and not gossip. And I'm going to tell you this, that's, a, that's a, a concern that people have in the sense of getting in a small group. Because I don't want to share prayer requests with people because if I share them with this group, they're going to go out everywhere. So there might be some things where you have to set up some, some covenant with the, the group to say, you know what, what's shared here, um, we're, that's, we're going to have it as a group. Uh, I'm going to share some of that as we get into prayer time, but prayer and not gossip. So, okay. uh, The idea of life transforming. Think of ideas here um, with a small group in a small group setting, uh, life transforming. I'll give you this. The group's love. Okay. So you can kind of build off of this in the sense of thinking of some practical things and some specific things, but think of other ideas too. Conviction of sin. Uh, I'm going I'm to write another word that I have down here in my, my notes. That's not a nice word, is it? 
intrusive. I don't want intruders. But if you're going to call people out when they're sin, one, first, you better be ready to be called out yourself. But then you have to let them know, we want to help. The reason why we're doing this is to help you. So there's this sense of it's loving, it's intrusive, um, calling out sin. You think of other ways that a group can be loving. I mean, life transforming. Accountability. Accountability. Okay, and I'm just, I'm going to put this underneath, even though that kind of fits with both of those. Accountability. What else? The idea of, um, I'm just gonna, I'm going to put it this way in the sense of getting deeper, getting deeper into the word. I tell you something that's been very encouraging to me over the last three or four years is reading more and more biographies of missionaries, of leaders, Christian leaders, and things like that, and seeing how God has worked in their lives. It's, it's just been, uh, that's, that's just, it's transforming in that sense of seeing what God is doing in other people's lives. The third um, big word that I had here was intrusive, loving, and challenging. I mean, in, in reality, you want to push the group. So, in the sense of life transforming, and you don't want it to be all about, like, the homework and doing the Bible reading and things like that. But here's the reality. If you have someone that's not getting into the Word, and it's a consistent thing that they're not doing it, and they're not doing the homework, and they're not spending time, and they're like, I'm just here. There's a part of you or someone in the group needs to challenge them to see what's going on. Because if you're saying, we're going to come together, we're going to do this study... You've signed up for this. You're part of this. And then they go, well, I'm not going to do it. If that was your kids, what would you do with them? Would you say, well, that's perfectly okay. You just go ahead, Johnny, and do what you want to do. And don't worry. No, you wouldn't do that. Now, I'm not telling you to discipline people like your, your children and your groups. But there's a sense of challenging them and, and helping them to see there's some things that are not right in, in how you're acting and how you're living in this, this community together. So, life transforming. I, uh, I brought these, and I'm actually going to leave these here. And these are just three examples. These are some biblical counseling resources. And uh, um, they're just, uh, there's, there's sets of them in, in, on all kinds of different topics. Uh, this one is leading uh, your child to Christ. Biblical direction for sharing the gospel with your children. So, this is, this is a, a resource here. I'm going to leave this here, and, and you can... Um, do whatever you want to do with that. This is self-esteem, looking up instead of inside. And this is something as a small group leader doing a study like this, you're going to get a lot of, even in church settings, you're going to get a lot of self-help, a lot of, I mean, if you go into a Christian bookstore and sometimes you see a lot of this kind of self-esteem talk and things like that. Um, but looking to God instead of looking to, you know, to yourself for help. And then this one is when crisis hits, where to turn when life fall, falls apart. And these three resources, along with other ones like that, they take a specific issue, and they're real short, and they give biblical help and direction for that. So you want to you be thinking about how you can share those things and those resources with people. Um, but ultimately, you want them to understand, it's not about a booklet for everything. This booklet is designed to help you get into the Word. And so that's what you want to that's what you want to be be doing in the sense of that life transforming. That once again it comes from spending time in God's word, spending time in prayer. Um, and you'll notice with all with almost all of these we get back to God's word and prayer. Okay. So 
Uh, anything else with life transforming? Okay, the, the next one is uh, equipping. And I, I, I worded it this way. Member equipping. And this is, once again, one of those things where, however you're doing things as a church and all that, you have a priority to help people that have covenanted together with you in membership and have submitted to the leadership of this church and become members of this church. You have a specific responsibility um, as leaders, as pastors, to help them grow. There are going to be people that are fringe people or regular attenders, things like that, but they haven't submitted to that the, the leadership of the church. And it's awesome that they're here and they're hearing God's word and, you know, all those things. But when I'm talking about this equipping, it's people that have said, this is my church family. I, I'm, I'm part of this church. I, I want to grow in this church. I'm submitting to the leadership of this church. And I want to be involved in the ministries of this church. So you're equipping members to do the work of the ministry of this church specifically. So thinking of this idea of uh, member equipping um, being a mark of a fruitful small group, how, how would this flesh itself out, or how would this look in a, in a small group setting? Multiplying. Multiplying? What do you mean by multiplying? Like second thing, second thing. Equipping them to be able to go out and, and to do their own okay. And thinking about even the setup that you have with the schedule, where I think it, you said it was going to be 10 weeks then there's the, the break, and then there's 10 weeks. Um, it might be something where if, if, if it's in this situation where there's a lot of people in groups and things like that, you might have some people in your group that you can say, you know what, you should be leading a group. For the second half, I want to kind of rotate with you with leadership, and maybe in the second half, you can start your own group. Um, some of our people can, some, you know, um, or it might be something where, and, and you might be as a leader, in different ways, different things, I... I always talk about multiplying, not splitting up or dividing. And that's just one of those language things, because when you talk about we're going to break up our group, it's like, no, you can't break up the group. We're the band. We're like together. Like, no, we're going to multiply. We're going to go out. And, and so you're trying to communicate. We, we want to grow. Um, we don't just want to be our little holy huddle there. But thinking about that idea of equipping leaders to, to lead a group, um, even the second session that you guys have here, um, what about what else about member equipping? Recognize spiritual gifts. What's that? Recognize spiritual gifts. Recognizing spiritual gifts. I mean, and, and a small group is a good way to speak into people's lives and, and talk to them about some things that you uh, you're going to do uh, that you've seen them uh, do and that you've seen in them. Yep. What else? I've seen it where there's, there's been some older ladies who have helped some of the younger ladies um, come together and prepare meals, like for their family, and, and prepare like large meals that you could freeze and things like, because someone's just not aware, how do, how do I cook a meal and freeze it and have weeks worth of food? And someone just saying, hey, come over to my house. I'm inviting three people to come over and do that. Just all those little, little things that you go, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you talk to the people that it happened to, it's quite an encouragement. And so, what else? Ser servanthood, serving. Yeah. Yeah. And so with that idea of serving, there's this sense of being willing to serve and being willing to ask when you need help. Because I think sometimes in a, in a church setting, and probably in one sense with people like this in this kind of setting there's a lot of people that are willing to serve but it's hard to say I need help can you can you help me with this and uh, I'm thinking about that so I think another thing I think about is when we're equipping two things one we touched on the multiplying factor and I just remind everybody you've been hearing this like a little mantra at least what I've been saying is who is your apprentice who is your apprentice who are you going to pick for your apprentice or who is your co-facilitator? That's kind of your grown-up friend that's yeah. already launched on a group uh, and everything between. And then I think of this study, for example, if I could use it for example, we're going to have a bunch of people go through this study who hopefully will have seen all these things in this manual before. The idea isn't just to see how many people can put a check mark on their name when they went through MacArthur's thing, but could they take somebody else through a portion of that with somebody else from memory? When a child or a grandchild yeah. or a nephew asks something about the authority of the scripture that's 
So, and as you think about even, even that, you think about if your group has a lot of parents of younger kids in there, there's a sense of you could, I don't want to say change the way this study is geared, but I'm going to say change the way the study, you do the study and say, how, how can you talk to your kids about God is sovereign? And, I'm, and that's, that's, that's one that I'll just share, you, share with you here real quick. I've, I've done this in, in teaching kids. God is the boss. God is sovereign as God is the boss. And you, you, they understand boss because their parents have bosses and things like that. But then you go, wait, their parents might complain about their bosses or their bosses aren't the best. So God is the boss. And here's the thing about God. God is a good boss. God is the best boss. God is a loving boss. And, and you kind of talk about those things and um, think about how, how do you address that. If you think about if, you're, if your group is made up of older people, and you think about the fact that God is sovereign. What does that mean, that God is sovereign? And you kind of gear it towards, my body doesn't work the way it used to anymore. I'm nearing the end of life, or you know, life hasn't worked the way that I thought it would. What does that mean, that God is sovereign in that situation? So thinking about those things and, and equipping people, not just getting through, like Pastor Nathan mentioned, the getting through things and saying, okay, we went through the study. Uh, but thinking about how you can equip people. Um, training and modeling, I, I had those words down there. Um, with the last two, I don't want to necessarily have as much discussion about this, but I want to give you these. Um, hope stirring, this is just from the passages we looked at, the Hebrews 10. Um, looking out for one another with a focus on God. This has to be more than once or twice a week. This might be something where you, you even in your groups, you set up prayer partners, you, you're checking in on one another, you have some ways that you're encouraging one another beyond you're taking a step beyond Sunday to do a group setting thinking about how you can take it beyond just okay all that we've done in the sense of stirring one another up and adding a small group is we've just added another hour to meet together that's not what you're doing how, how can the group connect beyond just that hour and a half and I, I, I tell you this in the sense of hope stirring and looking out for one another it's once again it's not your job necessarily to do it all but working with the group to set up some ways that you can care for one another and help one another. So, um, hope stirring. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Just real quick, because I don't want to necessarily go through it quickly. But. And then evangelistic. And I put down there, but not how you might think. This study, and I'm not sure, you know, in the sense of talking with the pastors about this a little bit, I'm not sure how, like, Invite an unsafe neighbor to come and learn the deeper. This, this might not be that study um, to do. But think about this. How can it be evangelistic in that nature? And we talked about this at the beginning. Uh, a couple of things. One, you're understanding who God is more and more and more so you, that you're better able to share that with other people. Two, you've got a, a group of people, and I, and I pray, and this is like the second or third time we've mentioned this, I pray that you as a group, you might think about, who is someone in my life that I want to share the gospel with? And your group is praying for that person with you. And maybe asking weekly or every so often, you know, have you had a chance to talk to that, that person? Um, so evangelistic. And here's, here's a third way. Here's a third way. And I didn't look up the passages, but if you look through a lot of the caring passages in the epistles, there's this sense of caring for the church body, caring for the church. And that being, as the world sees that, when there's an older person in your church, and the teens that are part of, you know, are connected with your church, whether it's the youth group or the small group or whatever, go over and mow her lawn, and someone next door says, hey, is that your grandma? No, no, she's someone from our church. You know, and they're able to see that people from the church are caring for this person. When there's a hospital visit, uh, one, of the, one of the funniest stories that I've, I've heard a person sharing about small groups was, they, they were talking about the fact that they went to visit, the pastor went to visit someone at their small group, uh, went to visit this person in the hospital. And the person started crying in the hospital when the pa he saw the pastor come through the door. And it wasn't because this pastor was mean or anything. It was the person said, am I going to die? 
And they were like, no, I just came to visit. And he goes, oh, I, like everybody in my small group has been by to visit and all that. I thought they finally just called the pastor for like last rites type things. And that was it. And they said, well, thanks. Thanks for coming. Every, the church has been really helpful in visiting. But how many times, and I'm, I don't know anything, pastors here haven't shared stories or anything like this. But how many times do you have people in your church where they, they'll have five people from the church visit them, but it doesn't count as a visit in the hospital until it's the pastor? Like there's something about that. Wouldn't it be great to, uh, and the, these men are probably thinking it would be great in the sense of, I don't have to answer every single need. And there's not that mindset. It's the church is here helping me. Not these two men are here to fill every need and, and answer all of those things and fill all those things. Exactly. And, 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 and expand on that, which I know you agree with. It's not that we would want to get out of it. No. As you know. Yeah. But, but so that they can see like transformation and be on themselves. Yeah. And then the needs are met because the needs are too great for one of you guys. Yeah. So yeah, and so it's, it's that idea of they're able to come and, and be a blessing to the person. And there's not this uh, like expectation of it has to be that person and that's it. But it's you're all caring for one another. It's a priesthood of believers. Um, and uh, thinking of that idea of evangelistic. And you think about this. You have an opportunity to talk to nurses. Talk to other family members that are visiting. So who are you? Um, someone from their small group. I'm someone from the church. And that happens several times. And people... I, I know this because I've seen it. Nurses and doctors and things start talking about, yeah, it's just weird. Like, all these people come in to see this person, and there's a lot that aren't family. They're just from their church. That, that's a testimony of what your church is doing and what God is doing there. So um, thinking about that evangelistic, but not necessarily in the way that you would think. So, okay. So, and then the third the third part here. Okay, any, any questions about those? The marks of the fruitful group. Uh, before we go on. Okay, so I want to take the, the last um, last 30 minutes or so uh, to go through a couple of uh, just some practical tips. And so I, I basically broke this time down into um, teaching time. Let me look here at my notes. Prayer time and children. Okay, so in, in looking at this, teaching time. It's different than preaching and proclaiming. And it's how to get every. So I want to, want to share this with you. How to get everyone to communicate. And I hope I've modeled this. I was going to point it out earlier in the night, but I hope I've modeled this in some way a, a couple of times throughout the night. Um, there's a sense of waiting. As a leader, it's real hard. Silence is hard. You ask a question, and you feel like it was a lead balloon dropped, and there's nobody saying anything. And a lot of times, we'll have a tendency to fill the silence with our own thoughts and opinions. I want to encourage you, and, and you may have, I, I, I do this all the time, I have my phone on me, and it's not because I'm checking things or anything, I have my timer up, and I'll, I'll sometimes even set that timer and give like 30 seconds. And it's awkward, and it may seem like it's two hours, or you may think, I've got a lot of stuff to get through. If, if, if I wait 30 seconds, like 14 times, that's like seven minutes that I could use for something else. But you're not giving people opportunities to think through things. And it's something to think about is, sometimes you've thought through this a lot and you're ready to share, but they might be thinking about it, your question for the first time, and they haven't had time to do that. So giving opportunity, giving time. And like I said, even if it's a matter of setting your watch and, or, or keeping a mental counting in your head, um, if you notice, even when I gave you time to answer questions, it was like I, I told you how much time you had left, uh, different things like that. So that idea of waiting, silence is not bad. The second thing is write answers down. Have people write answers down. Um, if you notice, I had those round blocks, and there were a couple of times like that that I did that. Um, Here's, here's something that happens, and um, I know you haven't had a formal small group ministry here, but in a class setting or maybe in a small group somewhere else, things like that. You have people that are quick responders, 
And you have people that are deep thinkers. And I'm not saying that the quick responders aren't deep thinkers. But you have people that, what, what uh, maybe I am saying that, but uh, I, I'm, a quick, I'm a quick responder too. So, uh, so you have that and then you have this. And if you just throw out a question and the, pers- the quick responder blurts out, the second he starts answering, answering it, the slow responders are like, I don't need to answer this. It's already being answered here. But that idea of writing answers down is helpful because it gives everyone a chance to think about it, to write it down. And here's something else. There are people that are also long responders. You know what I mean by that? There's the quick responder and then there's the the long responder. There's the person that will answer the question and then they have three stories to tell about it and they want to tell you about, like the, I was looking ahead to the next question, I want to share my thoughts on that before you even ask it. And they're just long responders. And here's a, here's a little suggestion. If you're going, I have been in a lot of small groups and I have never met the long responder. You're probably the long responder. No, I'm only joking. I'm only joking in that. So that's, that's not the case. That's not the case. Well, it might be the case. But, but, uh, um, but that idea of um, thinking about uh, uh, having people write answers down, everybody's able to think about them. But when you have people write down a response, and I, I gave you those blocks... I tell people, and I've done this in small groups, and, and people at first think it's awkward or hard, but then they get used to it after a couple of times. And it's just like anything, training. I tell them, write your answer in that block. <laughs> write your answer in that block. Everybody, take your time, write your answer in that block. Give them a little bit of time to write their answer down. And I'm like, okay, now read what you wrote. <laughs> And then you'll have the person that starts going, well, what I wrote was, and, and then I also want to say, no, everybody, we're going to have everybody share, read what you wrote. And everybody goes around and shares what they wrote, and that's it. Then you find that the long responders, and I'm just sharing real life here, you find the long responders learn how to write littler. <laughs> and you look at their block, and they're like, how did they get that many words in the block? But they, they understand what I've said right in the block. So, and then they got their camera out, they're magnifying the rhino. It doesn't get to that point. But, but that idea of um, waiting, silence is, is not bad, writing answers down, that idea of teaching. Now, I, I just want to talk um, just briefly about that, and I want to give uh, pastors a couple of minutes here at the end to talk about a couple of things. But specifically to the, the book, you think about, this is an older version of it, but uh, the fundamentals of the faith, why do fundamentals of the faith as a study? Why, why do you think this would be a good study to do? You need to know what you believe and why you believe it. What you believe and why you believe it. It's foundation. It's, once again, it goes back to that word of equipping. It's, it's uh, going to help you in whatever ministries you're doing. Um, to, to know what the church believes. Uh, and I think um, to grow in love for God and unity as a church. Theology is not a dry topic. It can be done in a dry way. But if you think about what theology is, it's understanding who God, the creator of the universe, is how he's communicated to us, how he saved us, uh, how he's put us into a body of Christ. All of those things are big, amazing truths. And when you think about this, think about it not in the sense of a checklist, getting through 20 lessons or whatever, but think about helping people, yourself included, just as the video had at the beginning there, growing in your love for God and your love for one another as you understand how God has created them. So, um, but, but thinking about that, one specific uh, reason, to, on that next page it says, one specific reason is to grow in understanding and unity as a church. Now, uh, here, here are some questions for you. So at your tables, you can answer this. Answer these four questions. The Bible consists of blank books of the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible was given by divine blank. The Bible reveals man's state by nature and presents the only means of his blank. 
The Bible is the only rule and final blank in all matters pertaining to Christian faith and practice. Okay? Have answers to some, all of those? Okay. The Bible consists of what? 66 books. The Bible was given by divine inspiration, inspiration divine authority. Uh, the Bible reveals man's state by nature and presents the only means of his salvation. salvation. The Bible is the only rule and final authority. authority in all matters pertaining to the Christian faith and practice. Does anybody know where these four statements come from? And it's not John MacArthur's Fundamentals of the Faith book. Not just Baptist doctrine. Where, where does it come from? Your articles of faith. So as you're going through this study, I would challenge you as a church to go to your doctrinal statement as a church and look at what it says about these things too. And one, checking yourselves against the Bible, your doctrinal statement, and what the study is, and, and working those out together. But uh, really just going, this isn't just a matter of we brought in this book by this, this pastor in California that we're going to do here. It's, these, these are statements from your doctrine statement. And every week, there will probably be statements, well not probably, there are going to be statements from your doctrine, your church's doctrinal statement that connect with this. Okay? Um, this next part here. Uh, don't use the group time too. And I'm just going to kind of blast through these so we can make sure that we're out at 8.30. Okay? Uh, but don't use group time to fill in the blanks. Don't use group time to give answers to everyone's questions. And you know what I mean by that? It's not like uh, you go through a study and that night, like a bunch of people, everybody has their questions. It's kind of like a Q&A time. Um, you don't, you don't want to, you want to answer questions. But you don't necessarily want to use all the group time to do that. Here's something that would be uh, a helpful way to do this. Someone asks a question. And... It's helpful for a couple of reasons. One, it helps with the time that you have as a group to use it better. And two, when I give you the, the way to handle some questions, you'll, you'll see how it can, the second way it can be helpful. That's a great question. We're going to talk about it next week. Why doesn't everybody go home this week and think about how you would answer that question, including you, the person that asked the question? Do some study, do some things about it, and next week that will be the first thing we talk about here. Now, there's two things that you need to remember. One, you need to make sure that you research the question. Two, uh, when you come back. And two, you need to remember to have that time in at the beginning. So, so thinking about that idea of you're, as a, as a small group leader, you're, you're not the answer person. You're not, hey, come on, bring your doctrinal questions to me. Ask them here during this time, and, we're all, and I'll answer them all. But you want to help the group know how to study God's Word better. Um, and, and find those answers. And so thinking about that, uh, that idea there, um, as a leader, you want to help them um, find the answers. So this is not preaching and proclaiming. Um, even in the, in the book they talk about, there's a difference between dialogue questions, and they go through a whole set of questions, things like that. Um, but you want to, you want to be able to, to uh, help people find answers, not just give them. Um, do use the group time. To engage, apply the passage, the doctrine, this idea of discuss and ask. Discuss things that, that come up from the study, ask questions. Uh, a, couple, a couple of things about asking questions. There's a whole section in the teacher's part of the book on questions, and you can see those different types of questions. But um, in a small group setting with discussions, if you've noticed a lot of the questions that I've asked today, other than those four at the top, they're not give me the one blank answer or give me a yes or no answer. They're getting people to think more and, and discuss more and, and be more engaged with the topic. So thinking about how you can, how you can ask questions. Um, and it might be, if you're not used to this, it might be thinking beforehand, going through and writing down questions that you think you want to ask. And then going, how can I rewrite those questions and make them better? And so thinking about the questions that you want to ask. But at the same time realizing, um, 
I got to be ready for wherever, you know, sometimes where the discussion goes and things like that also. So that idea of uh, asking questions, um, open-ended questions as opposed to close, as opposed to 66 books, um, yes, no. And if you do ask yes or no questions, what should you ask after or as part of the yes and no? Why? Why? And then that way it's like not just I'm going to throw out my yes or no answer and I'm done, but thinking about that. Okay? Um, and then we already talked about this, but helping the group find answers. So let's answer this for next week. Uh, and, and like I said, in the, in the book here, um, in, the, in the teacher's section, he has a, a there's a whole, uh, I think the page numbers are a little different in mine than yours, but there's a, a section called questions are the key to dialogue teaching types of questions, direct questions, overhead questions, rhetorical questions, uh, and, and rhetorical questions, you might want to use them, and you might want to tell people of a rhetorical question for you. And sometimes those questions are like the whole, something that they've been struggling with. And that way it's not like, a, you want to let them know it's a rhetorical question, I want you to think about this, and then you ask the question. Because I don't know if you've done this before, but I've done it. And you ask the rhetorical question, and you mean it to be rhetorical. You're like, what has been the biggest thing that you've struggled with this week? I want you all to think about it. And you have somebody yell out, you know, something. And then all of a sudden, everybody's mind is like, oh, man. You know, somebody just yelled out their answer. And you're thinking, I, I really want everybody to think about it. And then you had a next question to set up. But if you have rhetorical questions, it might be good to let the group know. In your mind, think about an answer. I'm going to give you a second and do that. Um, yeah, so that's teaching. Um, and then, like, with the study, they have the things with uh, uh, the ideas on, on the ways that the classes are set up. And I think Pastor Nathan has those things. I think there's an introduction lesson, and there's three weeks to cover one of the lessons. And then every lesson after that is, like, two weeks or something like that. I can't remember. It's all in the front there that you can, you can see with that. Um, I want to go through some things with that first week's lesson just quickly here in, in a minute, but any general questions about the teaching time or the things that we just talked about? Okay. Then uh, prayer time. Uh, biblical prayers. Model biblical prayers. I'll, I'll give you a resource. I don't have it here to show you, but um, uh, Praying with Paul, I think, is the new title of it. It used to be called... Um, called a spiritual reformation. It's a D.A. Carson book. He, uh, he goes through and he talks about Paul's um, prayers that he writes in letters to churches. And he talks about what, how, how he prayed, how Paul prayed for these churches and he wrote them down. It's a good book to look at and to go to um, your, your library. If you have, like in Grand Rapids, we have Hoopla, which is like the download audio books and e-books and stuff like that from the library. They have it there. I, I've listened to it a couple of times just because it's good reminders. Uh, called a spiritual reference reformation or praying with Paul, I think is the new title of it. But um, encouraging people to pray scriptural prayers, biblical prayers, and, and doing that. Um, so it, uh, if you think about this, and once again, brutal honesty, if an alien race came down to earth and got into a Christian small group and went and visited all these Christian small groups, you would probably think that the biggest priority for most Christians in their groups were, I want to get safely to the places I'm going and I never want to die. Because that's what we pray about. So-and-so is traveling, keep them safe, and uh, somebody's sick, and pray that they get better. Thinking about um, how, you can, how you can get people to think biblically about their prayers, challenge them to pay, pray biblical prayers, and think about God-focused prayers. And here's the deal. You do want to pray for people that are sick. You do want to pray for people that are traveling. But think about this in the sense of praying, um, and, and I'm just going to simplify it here just quickly for the sake of time, but you can expand this. If someone's traveling, pray that they would be a testimony of God's grace wherever they are and whatever happens. You don't necessarily need to pray this, but if their tire goes flat, that they would demonstrate in the front of their kids self-control, that if someone came along to help, that they would be a testimony of God's goodness and maybe be able to speak the gospel into their lives. 
um, but not just to get safely to a place. If someone is sick, pray that, and, and they're a believer or a person in your church, pray that they would be a testimony of God's goodness and grace, even in the midst of that, to the doctors, to the nurses, to the hospital workers, that they would be, that God would use that in their lives um, to glorify Him. And it's not just to pray that they would get better. And so thinking about that idea of you do want to pray for health, you do want to pray for safety, uh, but you ultimately want to pray that God would be glorified and that we as a group would make that known. Um, sharing prayer requests, uh, just a couple of things with this. One, make sure it doesn't turn into gossip. Two, um, remind people they don't need to share all the details. Um, sometimes you have people that want to share, like, the doctor said this, and this is going on with, you know, this part of my body, and this, and this, and this, and you're going, you know what, let's just kind of keep it basic. But uh, not all the details, God glorifying, not necessarily informative. <laughs> okay, so, so thinking about that idea. Uh, write down prayer requests. I do that, I do this too. I, I have people think about the same type of thing when we go to our prayer time and you're sharing prayer requests. Tell people, I'm going to give you about a minute or two. Write them down and then share them with us. And you can do that sometimes, maybe not all the time, but write them down. Uh, uh, sometimes what, what another good thing to do is to have people pray out their prayer requests. Because I don't know if you've ever done this. You've taken the time to share prayer requests and the time goes. And then all of a sudden you're at the end of it and you've, taken, you've had 20 minutes to pray, but 17 of it has been sharing prayer requests. And all of a sudden someone goes, oh man, we need to pray. And you don't pray for anything that anybody said. Something that, that is a, a good way to do this is to tell people, listen, have a pencil and a paper in your hand, and everybody pray for, for your prayer requests, and others write down what they're praying as, as they're praying. And I'll tell you something that happens in that, is a lot of times you're able to see people's hearts a little bit more. Because when you're talking about it, you just kind of go, yeah, I'm going to the hospital, and I'm a little nervous about it, and you know, they're giving all those details. But when they're committing it to the Lord and praying, you're able to see a little bit more of what, and it helps you to know how to pray for them. So praying out prayer requests sometimes. Uh, and I would tell you, this is a big thing. Um, share church-wide prayer requests. Um, and, and I would tell you something that might be helpful, however you want to do this as a, as a church. Um, missionaries of the week, ministries of the week, um, different things like that, and have like all of the churches praying and even maybe sending emails to missionaries um, knowing, hey, we're praying for you this week, anything, or next week, can you share some prayer requests and things like that? So thinking about that idea of uh, uh, church-wide prayer requests. Okay? Any, anything on, on prayer there? I mean, this is more on a more of time for them. Yeah. Shelly is working on having our church prayer list kind of completed for Lord's Day, for Sunday, instead of for Wednesday. It'll be available in print here. It'll be available in So, and when I, when I was talking about that idea of, like, church-wide prayer requests, that's not the whole, like yeah. Pastor Nathan mentioned, that's not the whole prayer sheet. Um, but maybe a couple of things there. I think with, in latest trips, I, where somebody's given a prayer request, while it's still fresh in people's memories, I'll say, okay, will somebody pray for God mm -hmm. right now? And that way it's not just 15 minutes of prayer yeah. request time and then five minutes of prayer request. Yeah. And I tell you this, there are things that you'll, you'll try, they'll work, they'll, you'll be like, we need to do that again, and they'll, you'll do that. And there are things that you'll try, and they won't work, and you're going, we're never going to do that again. That's, that's the nature of it. Um, children. I have two minutes to talk about children. It's not a problem for small groups, but rather an opportunity. I mean, I just want to say that. Um, if, you have, if you're a group that said you're going to have children, there are just a lot of different ways to do it, and I could give you a ton of them, but uh, you can, I, I, I can share those. I think I've maybe sent some, but uh, there's all kinds of options. One, telling parents, um, 
take care of your own child care. And it might sound harsh, but that's ways that I've done it with some groups is, you know, that way they find babysitters or they have teens in the house that are able to do it. But that's one way. Uh, two is you have some, some, thing, uh, some adults from the group rotating, going downstairs, uh, going to another room. You have uh, babysitters. There's some things that you even sent out in the email to people about those things. But the idea is um, don't look at it as, a man, we've got kids. That's a problem. How do we? No, it's an opportunity for you to figure out how to do life together with kids. And I tell you this, as much as possible, include the kids. And that's not necessarily having them there in the small group time and stuff like that. But do some things like a potluck together and have your kids all interacting with one another um, and uh, getting to know each other too. Uh, one thing that we've done, and I would say this isn't for every group, but for some groups, um, introduce family worship. We had one group that we did, we had a lot of kids, and we actually, for the first five, ten minutes, we had all the kids and the family together up in the room, and we did a little Bible lesson together. One of the ladies did something based on what the Sunday school lesson was that past week. We had them there, and then we dismissed the kids, and that was, that was a great time. It was, it, was, it was an awesome time, but it's not for every group, <laughs> depending on you know the makeup of the group. So... Um, so, I know that's kind of a quick thing with the kids, but I, I just want to encourage you, there's a lot of different ways to do that. You can talk to Pastor Nathan, if you even if you wanted to get in touch with me, you can do that. Um, in closing there, I just uh, have that website down there at the bottom. That's some resources I put on there. I'm going to actually put that Piano Guys song on there, just because it's a, a, a kind of a, a good song to listen to. But uh, some of the other videos, the first song that I played, the David Platt video, some other things there just to be a resource for them. So I, uh, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to come and share. Hopefully it's been a blessing and encouragement to you and some helps. Um, I know uh, we got about eight, ten minutes here. I don't know if that's too little time, too much time, whatever. But, uh, um, yep. Yep. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you, David. done the first study or listened to the sermon already. Okay? So, um, the first night that, that I'm looking forward to getting to my group, um, first of all, we're just going to try and get to know each other. I'm going to think of questions just so that, you know, where the people work or, or do work or maybe generally when they were to save their family or their kids. It's going to be to know each other. That's, that's the first purpose. And I, I think a prominent purpose of the first evening together is people know their names, know their children's names, know, know where they work, where they live. Um, another purpose of that time, I think, would be a time of prayer. We will be putting out this uh, small group prayer list, but also just to, to share some personal prayer requests and at least have a time of prayer that evening. Another major purpose of that first evening has been to describe how we're going to do this study of because this is not a, this is not a, uh, in my group, I'm not going to preach for, for a half an hour. That's, that's not what this is. This is a group learning experience. And you're going to want to describe a kind of time commitment or what these people are looking forward to doing or bringing to this group. Um, what they have been learning in their own Bible study. We, for instance, one of the major responsibilities, I think, of an individual person who's going to be involved in this whole group is to at least have listened to Jonathan MacArthur's sermon on the subject before they come to this and they give ask questions. I don't know if you know this or not. There is an app, Grace to You app. You can download all the sermons on the Grace to You app on the phone. And if you listen to in my in my group that night, I'm going to maybe go to each person's phone and see if they understand. How to download the app, how to download the sermons on the app, and then it's two clicks to listen to the sermon that week and uh, putting that, you know, it would be on the road to my car. I've already listened to the uh, first sermon three times, right? And uh, in fact, I'm taking notes on it. But anyway, that's the kind of thing I'm going to be doing the opening night is to make sure they understand what to do in order to do this. So, you know, you do the workbook. Sermon and uh, be thinking about that, how you, can, how you can contribute or questions that you might have about what was, about what was said or what was said. Any 
questions you have about starting with this ministry of practice. Okay. I got an idea for this. Take 30, 45 seconds and write down a question. <laughs> and we'll answer to it. Okay. All right, I'm counting. I'll give you a minute. Okay, I'm going to take a few questions and I'll tell you what, uh, one other thing I'm going to do, I want you to know that I'm available for as much help as any of the facilitators need for any questions you may have. If you want to come in and meet with me about facilitating a group, maybe you have some practical questions about how to conduct this or what to do, make an appointment, okay? I'm, I'm available. Um, I'm going to let you have access to my notes that, that I would cover with the group or how I would phrase any questions or coming up with handouts or anything like that. I want to make that easy. Possible. A couple of questions. Someone. Scott. It well, looks like there's all sorts of questions. And when the questions, they seem like it would be personal nature. I've never been in a Bible study where they hand it on. Like it says in there. So how do you how do you think that's going to go? Or how do you promote people here? Like, the, the homework that I see in the book, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's not really easy. Right, all um, those facts. So there is an application questions at the end. I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't know how how open this is going to be. Any suggestions for how to handle it? Anybody ever talked about this before? David, what do you think of the idea that this series tells the leader to have people turn in their sheet and put the answers in if they're wrong and give them back? Do you think? Okay. And that's an additional. Step. I mean, I'll just share. Honestly, I, I think that. I would probably share the answers with the leaders or with the individuals in the groups so they're able to check them and make sure they do have right ones. But to go through and answer them and check them and all that. That's helpful. That's, that, I don't know how helpful that would be in the sense of for the leaders to work. Like to get them, they collect them and the leader check them. So, but that's going to take time. Yeah. No, I would say get the answer key to everybody. Or, okay. Or, okay. Yeah, just share that with people so they're able to check their factual answers. And then use some of the deeper I think they, in the discussion. They really, really, really are going to like you now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you want to make sure that they have the right answers to yes. those questions. Yeah. So. so, based on that, everybody in the group is going to put a couple of shares. Or a couple of shares. It's $5. I'll pay you for it. Just, if you want me to get your husband a book, I'll pay you for it. Just give me a book. Five bucks. Concerned sometimes if someone well my my wife did a book, so I didn't have to. Yes, Tim. One of the things
I don't want to scare anybody by telling them to sign something, but, but um, I think it's good to talk about those kind of things as to what we're, what we're committing to in the group. Maybe having something written that people see that this is what we're doing in this study maybe, that you're committed to. I've hit that uh, in my group of small groups, and they, they always told me, have a group covenant, you know, have a sign it. It's a very common thing. But in my experience, just putting it in print, saying these are the values, this is what you're participating in, that's a little less of creating like this secret order or something, and <laughs> just asking people to get on board with the values. They should know the time and place now where, okay. where when the small when the first small group meeting is started, right? Well, we're encouraging you to communicate, to have each other's text number, you know, if you text phone number, if you call on phone, email, if you do email, Facebook message, if you do Facebook message. Because it's not even just the day of your meeting, it's the next day on the prayer accountability thing we talked about the night before. Multiple interaction. And basically, it comes to your facilitator, shepherd, and your group. Yeah, I didn't get everybody's phone number on my sheets. I don't know if some of, them, some of the sheets, I don't think people filled that out. So at least that first evening, I want to make sure I got everybody's email and phone number address so we can facilitate communication about uh, meetings. She was saying she intends to contact uh, people ahead of time and even as a host kind of say, hey, let me know if you have a, an allergy or something like that around and here's how I get to the house or whatever and you don't have to wear your shoes or you can wear your shoes. And <laughs> she didn't say that part.
with him. And as we engage with your word, help us to be, first of all, looking into it and doing a study for our, for our own spiritual growth and then sharing what we are learning and how we, we are being challenged with, with others in our group. Help us to, to, to follow what you need. In Jesus' name I pray.